All right, so I realize Japan is an East Asian country, but it is relevant to uh, the topic because they're going to be uh, a fairly integral part of uh, this imperialism uh, in the 1890s and onward and, and starting World War II. Also, they're going to uh, match up with Russia uh, chronologically and have a much more successful imperialistic experience. So uh, both of these states were embarrassed by Western industrialized powers uh, at roughly the same time. Um, in 1853 to 54, I think in both cases actually, uh, they were both humiliated uh, in the face of Western imperial industrial uh, bullying, essentially. We were mentioned with Russia, they lost the Crimean War to the British and to the um, um, French against the Ottoman Empire in Crimea, uh, and that was a, a good lesson for Russia to learn that it was behind industrially needed to catch up if they wanted to continue to uh, expand their imperial empire. And uh, Japan is going to learn this lesson at the hand of uh, the United States, primarily. Uh, and they're one of their first examples of, of, of attempting to imperialize. So I'll start with first the United States, because we already got a preview of Russia. So uh, Japan, uh, in 1853, um, several ships under the command of U.S. Commodore Matt, uh, Perry are going to uh, basically threaten Japan to open up trade. Since this is an AP world, if you're an AP world, you probably know this. But since the 1630s, the, uh, the, the Japanese had closed themselves off completely, entering an era called Sokoku over the, under the Tokugawa Shogunate, where they banned any foreign interaction. So foreigners that came in or Japanese went to foreign places um, would be imprisoned, punished, and likely executed for that. The only openings they had were a couple ports to the Chinese and the uh, Dutch. That was it. Any other contact the outside world was, was cut off. And they were had since the... Taika reforms of the 7th and 8th centuries, uh, they have been largely abiding by the, um, uh, the, the Han Chinese Confucian system uh, regarding how they uh, administered uh, their territories, ran their governments, uh, aligned their culture, along with um, a Buddhist influence as well. Um, and they've been feudal since about the 12, 1300s or so onward, uh, just like Europe had been for a while. Uh, so they were cut off. So they didn't trade with anybody, and the U.S. wanted to, um, since they're a bit late to most of the imperial activity uh, in the 1850s, uh, just before the Civil War, um, and of course, uh, once the Civil War begins, they're going to pretty much discontinue most of their imperial activities for a while, at least until the 1880s and 90s. <clears throat> um, they're going to show up in Japan and force them to open up uh, by trade, uh, and they threatened to bombard them, and they actually demonstrated their uh, capabilities with the U.S. gunboats. And the Japanese didn't have any way of really resisting that. So Commodore Perry showed up, uh, forced them to open uh, their ports. They said, we'll be back in a year. And they made their rounds in East Asia and China, coming back in 1854. Uh, and while there was some plan to resist by several Japanese, they uh, ultimately, the ambassador that was charged with uh, dealing with the delegation from the United States sort of compromised and... Uh, uh, resisted a bit as far as negotiating goes, but ultimately uh, had to capitulate to the uh, American presence because they just had no capacity to stop them. Um, particularly when they also found out that the, the British were interested in engaging in trade and the Russians were interested in engaging in trade. Uh, they realized they had no real means to stop the um, uh, Western powers from, from bullying them. So um, this is where they are forced uh, to open to trade uh, by the U.S. So in both instances, they're going to be humiliated, uh, defeated by Britain and France. And in both cases, there's going to be a, sort of an internal decision to industrialize because they're, they're, they're behind. So for Japan, they're, they're, they've already seen by the 1850s, they've, uh, by the mid-1850s, they've already seen the first opium war, and they're just about to see the second opium war. And how China, who had traditionally been the powerhouse of the region, uh, is being bullied by these uh, foreign European states. They begin to see how um, they need to get with the program, or they're going to become another victim uh, and suffer the same fate as places like uh, India and other parts of the world that are being colonized or had been colonized. Uh, so both um, try to industrialize. It's going to go slightly differently because there's going to be there's going to be resistance in both. Uh, most of the uh, Western reforms are going to be enacted by uh, czars. Actually, it's just Russian for emperor. Um, there are some czarist reforms, uh, most notably under uh, Alexander 
the second, Tsar Alexander II, he's going to uh, do a couple things, but the most noteworthy one that we've mentioned before, I'll mention again, is he emancipates the serfs. Emancipates the serfs. And that's going to end legal um, private but not state, or at least it's different. We don't need to get that detail. There, there are private serfs, like household serfs that owned, uh, and there's also state serfs that uh, aren't actually um, uh, freed until like the 1866, I think. But in the 1860s, 1861 when it started, uh, they're going to free these serfs, um, and the idea is by ending this feudal system where a bunch of no Russian nobles uh, control everything for the most part along with the Tsar, and it's pretty much all peasant-based agriculture, or serf-based agriculture, they're going to try to end that by um, taking the territory from the nobles, giving it uh, to these peasants, and we'll talk about how in a second, um, much to the uh, chagrin of the nobles, who of course lose a substantial amount of power and authority uh, by doing this. So um, this is going to be opposed by nobility. They're ultimately not gonna be able to uh, stop these reforms as they progress. They're gonna assassinate Alexander II in 1880. Later, later on, uh, but the but the reform is going to continue um, in the 1890s, especially uh, as they, they go forward. But one major issue here was Russia, unlike Japan, which I'll get to, uh, they are going to uh, completely lack a merchant uh, or gentry class. One of the reasons why the U.S. to a lesser degree, but certainly Great Britain and Germany are going to industrialize as quickly as they do, and in Japan to a lesser degree, is they have a substantial, in the 1600s and 1700s for, for, for Great Britain and the 19th century uh, for, um, for Germany, they already have a large like middle class of, of, of landed gentry, landowners, and merchants, <clears throat> and, and a financial system too, by the way, uh, and financial system. So that's why I'm, uh, England, Germany, and to a lesser extent later the U.S. Uh, and, and uh, Japan, but certainly England and Germany, they're going to show us quickly because they have these, these features already waiting. Russia doesn't have that. For the most part, it's uh, nearly all serfs, and then uh, plus a few very, very rich, powerful, wealthy nobil nobles. Uh, and they, they stay wealthy after the reform, so they have no real incentive to try to industrialize. It's not like they were middle-class, semi-wealthy, commercial uh, elites that are genuinely motivated to, to gain a lot more power and prestige uh, through reforms like in England and in Germany uh, and the United States and then later Japan. Uh, Russia kind of lacks that. So you just have basically a whole bunch of people who have nothing going out and starting from scratch and then a bunch of people who also are not going to um, uh, really be motivated to do that. Also, too, even though the Tsar is going to be passing a lot of these reforms in Russia, uh, whether it's Alexander or, 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 or uh, his successors, uh, most czars generally distrusted capitalist enterprise. Like, they, they didn't, they feared these companies because they saw this in the United States, certainly the United States and other European states too. They saw how powerful these corporations became uh, and they didn't want that, that to threaten their power. So what you had was this weird scenario where the czars initiating, initiating these reforms, but uh, the czar also maintains a really strict uh, bureaucracy. For example, you couldn't just go start a business. You had to have, if you're going to start a corporation in Russia, you'd have like expressed consent from the czar or his bureaucrats. And those bureaucrats were not like, uh, did not earn their position because they were good at what they did. It wasn't merit-based. They were just uh, handed these positions, uh, assigned them essentially uh, through hereditary uh, um, um, uh, Heredity, through heredity, heredity. I'll just say that because I'm, I'm forgetting the word. Uh, they either uh, earned it by their by their uh, birth, uh, or they um, obtained it some other way that wasn't like their own ability. So you actually had a lot of progress and enterprise in Russia stopped by this sort of uh, intentionally uh, restrictive czar uh, slash czarist bureaucracy that really uh, throttled, uh, not throttled, um, put the brakes on uh, development of free market enterprise. Uh, in Russia, uh, and you are so the, the ones that do get through are going to form these really controlling monopolies that um, do the have the negative practices that are associated with with free market capitalism, like cartels, monopoly, monopolies, like uh, reducing competition, innovation, and, and
price hiking and things like that. So uh, you're going to have the czars stopping a lot of innovation uh, by making it really difficult to engage in these uh, economic practices, and you're going to have a lot of uh, monopoly issues. Uh, and most of the companies that do get started, um, they're really dependent on the czar, uh, so they're going to be uh, really um, attached to uh, state funding. Uh, and, and again, this is getting increasingly complex, but Russia doesn't have a whole lot of money to hand out. Uh, they're pretty much agricultural. Uh, they don't have these financial systems and these large industrial complexes and commercial uh, enterprises to get all this tax revenue and dish out. So they have a low amount of money to, to dish out in the first place. They make it really hard for people that do start a business to start a business, and the ones that do get there monopolize it. So there's really not a lot of room for growth. Uh, so they're going to uh, remain largely, largely agricultural. Uh, and they're not going to do very well uh, when they attempt to industrialize. So I, I did mention a lot of things here. Um, so this is going to be shown in a couple instances, which I'll describe in more detail. First, in the 1880s, they're going to be uh, sort of bluffed down by the uh, Chinese, who later are, are shown to be quite weak uh, compared to uh, the Western and uh, Japanese industrial powers. Bluffed down by Chinese. Uh, and humiliatingly enough, in 1905, they're going to be the first uh, European power to lose to an Asian power. Uh, they're going to lose in a head-to-head -head, um, conflict with uh, Japan, who uh, started their process at the exact same time. So that's going to be a, a traumatizing event, which I'll, I'll get to here in a second. But let, let's continue with Japan here uh, for a bit, and then we'll move on to uh, the last section on new imperialism. So. That's Russia, and that's going to be why their industrialization is going to suck. So to sum it up really quickly, they lack those uh, entrepreneurial commercial classes. It's mostly just serfs and then highly uh, landed wealthy nobility who have no incentive to do anything. The czar makes it difficult to even engage in industry, even after these reforms. Um, oh, and one I forgot. There's no like private property like you're going to have in England and Germany uh, and the United States and Japan. Uh, where am I putting that now? They do free the serfs, but it's not like they hand the, uh, the property over to individual serfs to like try to, to, uh, to uh, expand and, and um, profit from individually. They, they do this sort of weird mix of where they, they kind of like give it to the village. So it becomes like a local commune. Uh, it's not communism uh, per se, but... It's not that the property is yours to benefit from either. Uh, it's some sort of joint communally held village uh, territory. Um, so it, it kind of stays feudal uh, in that respect. So uh, not individual private property. So you're really going to have a, a, a lack. It's held mostly by the village and community. So you're going to have like a lack of incentive here for uh, really working it well or innovation. So it was really a, a poor way to set this up. So um, Tsar makes it difficult uh, to even engage in business. Uh, and of course, you've got these unqualified bureaucrats uh, assessing people uh, anyway. Normally, you'd want people who are competent in, in banking or finance to be analyzing you know, a company's propositions, not just some guys who were handed the spot. Um, they lack that, that urban class. There's no genuine private property that people want to actually expand upon and profit from. It's communally based or village based. Um, not, not universally, but, but to a large degree. Uh, and also they have issues with monopolies for the companies that do get through. So it really, really, really stymies um, industrial development. And again, that's going to uh, result in them uh, backing down to the Chinese. Certainly losing this great game competition that the British had going on. They will continue to expand into uh, Central Asia just because there wasn't a whole lot uh, as far as resistance in the area. It was much of local, non-industrialized uh, polys or smaller ones. Uh, but they will lose to Japan in 1905, which we'll get to in a bit, uh, which is really, really, really going to uh, humiliate them. Actually, to the point that they experience a revolution in 1905 that almost overthrows the Tsar. But we'll get to that uh, in, in a bit. Japan has a totally different approach. Uh, the Japanese do a really good job historically of admitting when their culture uh, is lacking compared to another. So they did this with the Taika reforms um, just after the classical era um, in world history where they, they basically went, wow, China, that's a great model. Let's copy it. And they went and literally copied as much as they could uh, of the Chinese centralized system and the Confucian uh, Han system. 
and, and they adopted the culture and politics and economic practices of China, uh, and they benefited, at least compared to how they were before. And then when uh, they see the success of these Western empires, they're going to essentially do the same thing after some internal disputes. So let's not forget that they don't just immediately try to copy the West. There is going to be a bit of infighting for a 10-ish year period. So from a roughly 1856 to about 1866 or 68, we'll say 68 because that's the name of the actual period of transition. There is going to be some, uh, what you would kind of consider like a civil war type condition. Civil war conditions. So it was basically some Japanese wanted to maintain their traditional system of like a feudal uh, Europe kind of idea. Obviously they didn't copy the Europeans, but they had shoguns, which were kind of like kings, and daimyo, which were kind of like uh, the lords and barons. And they had a very strict feudal system with samurais that were just like knights, and then uh, peasants and merchants below that. Um, and, and they sort of had a fealty-type system uh, there as well. So uh, they're going to have, some people want to maintain that, their traditional samurai feudal-based uh, um, style. Uh, the shogunate. Uh, so the shogunate. So these are the anti-foreigners. Right, the, the ones that want to maintain the system uh, versus the, uh, um, how do I phrase these? The imperialists, I guess? That's how I'll phrase them. The ones that support the emperor, uh, which is where it gets its name, Emperor Meiji, the Meiji Restoration. These are the pro-foreigner uh, powers. And uh, they get the added bonus of um, not only having a lot of Japanese support them because they blame the shogunate for falling behind the rest of the world, but also... Um, they're going to get some aid from um, Great Britain, uh, mostly, and that's actually going to make Great Britain and uh, Japan pretty good friends all the way up to World War uh, II, when Japan, of course, takes many uh, British territories uh, during World War II, when they align themselves with Hitler and the Axis powers. Uh, but they do, uh, they're going to gain some aid from Britain and form an alliance, and ultimately, by 1868, uh, this side is victorious. Uh, and rather than these old feudal lords sort of resisting or, or not being compliant with the new government, they actually do almost wholly just voluntarily uh, join up with these imperial forces and um, cooperate. So it's going to be much more cooperative. There is isn't a civil war period, obviously, um, but they're more supportive than the initial uh, Russians were as far as industrializing. So this is going to be uh, victorious, this, this faction. And uh, in 68, we have what's called the uh, Meiji Restoration. And that was the emperor. So that is, that is, feudal Japan is now out. We now have imperial Japan, one that's run by the emperor um, and is bent on expanding Japanese influence uh, and industrializing along with the Model of the West. And they go all out, too. Uh, so what they begin doing is they begin sending out, um, what can I call them? Not learning missions. Well, we'll just, we'll just call them learning missions. We'll, learning missions. This wasn't the only one, but it was like the most famous one. It's called the Iwakura mission uh, in the 1870s. And they literally, they send out officials and students to Western universities uh, and undercover agents into Western factories, and they copy everything they can about Western schooling, science, uh, military technology, tactics, uh, culture, economic practices, and government. They copy all of it. They copy all Western uh, uh, culture, society, politics, economics, and uh, military tactics and technology. They primarily focus on Great Britain and the United States, but they also are going to be involved with the French too. Uh, so they go all out. So again, uh, Japanese students going abroad, you have undercover agents going abroad just to catalog how these things all work. Uh, and then you have officials doing the same thing, copying everything they can. Uh, so they're going to do, uh, with the one exception of, no, I wouldn't even say exception, because they pretty much copy the German uh, model, the Prussian model, of um, a constitutional monarchy. So they kind of still have an absolute emperor who is in charge of the nation, uh, but they have a separate parliamentary government as well kind of like how the Reichstag is going to operate with the Kaiser in Germany, to where the Kaiser has the ultimate say, but the Reichstag also is largely running the government and, and, and has, has a, uh, a substantial voice. They're going to make a lot of reforms. They're going to have a, a constitutional 
uh, monarchy, but an, I want to put an asterisk here because it's not really that they limit the, gov the, uh, the emperor who remains relatively absolute. In fact, he may be entirely absolute, but it's conjoined with a, a, a uh, representative assembly. So it's going to be emperor, absolute, uh, plus a, a representative assembly. All right, just like the Prussian model. They pretty much copied them there. Uh, and they uh, adopt military weapons and tactics from the, uh, from the Westerners. And their goal here is let's not become victims of imperialization like by 1868 China already had in two opium wars. India has been uh, being administered by uh, Britain. Uh, Russia's expanding into other parts of Asia and Central Asia. Africa is becoming incredibly or in increasingly pressured uh, by uh, Europeans. The Japanese realize they've got a good geographical position as far as um, um, not being targets anytime soon. But uh, with, with Chinese sovereignty being threatened, they realize that they would be next, of course. Uh, and the U.S. is just out of their own civil war, so they haven't been too involved in Japan. That kind of gave them a few years to focus on industrializing, which they're going to do. So they uh, constitutional monarchy, Western government. Uh, and they, um, they're going to adopt, and, and military, did I not write that? Yeah, Western military, reforms, technology. Uh, they're also, and this is critical, they're going to uh, copy the um, Western free market slash private property uh, system. So they're going to have free enterprise uh, as much as they can. Uh, and what's nice about that, this for the Japanese is those, um, those daimyo that, that had uh, feudal land holdings and, and obtained wealth through the Han system, they get all of their pensions back in a lump sum from the government, uh, and they're going to use that money to invest in these uh, new industrial practices. So the daimyo are super happy to do this because they're not like these ultra-mega rich, powerful landowners like they had in, in, in Russia. They're like, you know, medium to lower rich, uh, depending on the individual, obviously. But many of them were willing to invest in these new companies, and because there was so much room for growth, because Japan does have a, a large merchant class uh, and middle class and financial system, because they adopt the Western banking uh, structures as well, uh, they're going to um, uh, do really well uh, with their investments. Uh, they're gonna see a lot of growth in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, and onward. Um, so the, uh, the daimyo, uh, are willing and enthusiastic uh, participants slash investors. Uh, so um, Japan's going to experience uh, unprecedented economic um, growth in this period from uh, the 1870s uh, to the, uh, well, to World War II certainly, but we'll, we'll, we'll cap it off here in the uh, uh, 1930s is what we'll say. So huge, 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 huge advances. Uh, and they're actually going to get a couple opportunities to show that. The first one that's really going to excite them is, um, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of us as far as chronologically goes, but I do want to mention this now, um, since I'm on the topic of the two, they are going to get a chance to show that off. Uh, and this is important because, like I said, Japan's actually going to shift in just a matter of decades um, from a... From a a, a complete victim or potential victim of Western imperialism to a competitor, uh, an imperial competitor for the West uh, in East Asia. So their, their goal becomes to become the dominant imperial power in East Asia uh, over China and over the Western powers, uh, and they begin that here. Uh, and their first attempt to do that, a successful attempt, I should add, uh, is going to be a conflict with China, known as the first, the second one's in the... Um, um, 1930s uh, and 40s, the first Sino, which is uh, a term for, 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 for Chinese, Chinese culture, uh, Sino-Japanese War, in 1895, and Japan wins that by a mile. They uh, outperform, outrun, uh, and out, uh, outman, out, out, out innovate, out everything. Uh, the Chinese who had traditionally been dominant they were maybe willing to accept temporary losses to the West who they weren't you know, aware of and, and, and uh, diligent against. 
but certainly a, a much smaller submissive state in the region historically, defeating them was a, was a huge slap in the face. And it was a great example, an indicator uh, for the rest of the world that China was actually much weaker than they thought. So these, these scares Russia experienced in the 1880s that had the world going, oh, it looks like China's catching up. They've tried to modernize the military. They're, they're a threat. Uh, that was instantly thrown out when they lost to Japan uh, the way that they did. So Japan actually wins this conflict. They're going to take Korea, which has been a, um, a puppet state or controlled by China for um, centuries, as well as Taiwan and I believe some coastal territory along southern China. But don't quote me on that one. Uh, that's going to be a major, major, major victory for, for Japan, and that's their first expansion of Imperial Japan since uh, uh, Japan attempted to invade Korea and China in like the 1200s uh, and, and failed. So, Japanese victory. They gain control of Korea and Taiwan, both previously controlled by uh, Hawaii. Hawaii, where'd that come from? China. And um, what else was I going to mention? Oh, showed the West, China, um, was weaker than they thought than previously thought. They basically have to see that that self-strengthening movement where the Chinese tried to use their own innovations to copy as little as possible from the West and advance themselves uh, was a failure. So that's Japanese um, industrialization. And this is why they're going to win, or win, they're going to succeed uh, relative to the uh, um, uh, Russians. Because first of all, they're willing to, um, as a population. They do have their civil war period, but um, they're ultimately going to be victorious with some foreign aid, ally themselves with Great Britain, um, go out and copy as much, or learn as much as they could about economics, politics, uh, and military technology, and science from the West as possible with missions like the Iwo Kura mission. They're going to come back and adopt as much Western, um, uh, as many Western policies as possible, including, critically, the privatization of things individually, uh, and they're going to adopt free market practices and those, those daimyo, those, those, and those merchant classes that were, exist in Japan but not in Russia, are going to invest in these early companies and they're going to profit uh, massively. So the Japanese are going to be very happy and willing participants in this process. They have the means to do it, uh, and they're going to far outpace and uh, outperform the Russians. So, where that really is um, shown is the conflict over control of the railroads in what is Manchuria. Um, Russia and Japan um, both wanted access and control of this territory, particularly this railroad. Uh, so much so that they actually argue over and fight over it, and in 1905, fight a conflict referred to as the uh, Russo-Japanese War. 1905. And this is actually the war with the only and biggest uh, naval battle that consisted primarily of battleships. These new steel ships with massive guns that everybody thought would dominate naval warfare, except that they invented aircraft carriers shortly after and just made uh, battleships almost useless. So, um, Russia got just stomped. They got uh, absolutely um, humiliated on land, outmaneuvered by the Japanese, cornered uh, to their naval base, and the Japanese had them surrounded. So they sailed their whole Baltic fleet of um, uh, battleships and destroyers and cruisers all the way around the uh, world, basically. Um, not able to use the Suez Canal because the British controlled it and were allies of the Japanese. Uh, I think it took them several months. I don't remember if it took six months or four. Hell of a long time to sail over there. And the Japanese, in one battle, sunk or captured all of their ships in one single battle uh, as they were going through. Uh, they actually used technology for the first time, uh, I think in naval history, certainly in Japanese history, where they saw the Russian ships, telegraphed the message to their uh, navy positioned in Korea, who were able to uh, sort of ambush the Russians in their convoy. And they had slightly quicker ships, so they raced out in front of them. Uh, and formed basically a row, and when the, the, the Russians turned in to fight them, they just kind of took out each ship one by one, and then the, the Russians either had to surrender or, 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 or be sunk. Uh, and they were absolutely humiliated by that. Um, and that actually was so humiliating, this loss to, to an Asian power, so what we put here, uh, major Japanese victory, uh, and the first Asian power to defeat um, 
in a conflict, the uh, a European power. Uh, the Chinese technically beat the, the French on land in the 1880s, but on the sea they had no chance against the French uh, or British. Japan, though, won on both fronts uh, and humiliated them. So that was a testament to the advances uh, and success of Japanese industrialization and imperialism. imperialism. But uh, more importantly, for future events uh, and references, there's actually going to be a Russian revolution here. Um, while the Tsar doesn't get overthrown, uh, he is going to make several um, liberal democratic concessions, including for the first time not being an absolutist Tsar and allowing the people to have a uh, representative assembly, much like a parliament or a congress, uh, with the Duma. There were others, but I'll, I'll, I'll just mention that one here. Duma uh, created. That's important later because they're going to be the uh, main initiators of the... Um, uh, of the Russian Revolution in 1917, which ends in the Bolshevik Revolution and the, the beginning of the Communist Soviet Union. Uh, but that's a uh, period four topic. And that's not on this test this year because of the, of the uh, uh, COVID quarantine. But uh, I will be making those videos anyway for, for future years because these will be good for years to come as far as info goes. So that's all of the major events regarding Japanese and Russian imperialism. I haven't included a whole lot of China because we'll get to that because we still have to talk about Africa uh, and um, Europeans and China. But that'll kind of conclude it and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk briefly about um, competition between um, uh, uh, the European powers that are going to ultimately lead to World War I and then um, some social issues and debates created about this whole practice of imperialism. So let's move on then to uh, finally this new wave of imperialism beginning in the 1880s. Let me quickly update this map, so we'll do, uh, what do I do for China? Red, we'll do, we'll do the same thing. No, we'll, Japan will be black, that's what we'll do. So, uh, Japan opens, and 1853, with the Meiji Restoration here in 1868. That's where Japan, of course, is going to um, industrialize. And then we have the first Sino-Japanese War, 1895, where uh, they lose to Japan, and they gain Korea and Taiwan. And then the uh, Russo-Japanese War, in 1905, and uh, the uh, Russian uh, Revolt or revolution. Not the one in 1917, but the, um, the 1905 one, where the Tsar does maintain his position but concedes uh, to the Dumas. Am I missing anything that I mentioned? I don't think so. I guess the Evil Corps mission. I don't need to put that though. That's good enough. Oh, 1864, Japan opens up, uh, as well as the uh, Crimean War here. I guess that's going to be black as well, but that's uh, for Russia. So a lot of events here going on. And then I could even put actually 1861, they have a uh, emancipation of serfs from 1861 to uh, 66. All right, so that is Japan and Russia. And now let's talk about Africa, uh, China in the new imperialist phase, and then uh, the social and competitive um, um, effects.